Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for your attention today as I spend some time nerding out about martial arts and hip-hop. My name is Spencer Todd Bennington. I'm a writing instructor from the United States, where I currently teach freshman composition in the English department at Virginia Tech. My talk today is called Last Dragons of Staten, Bruce Lee and Martial Rhetorics in Hip-Hop Culture. 2023 marks the 50th anniversary of Enter the Dragon's debut, the film that is said to have kicked off the kung fu craze in the West and propelled Bruce Lee to a posthumous superstardom across the globe. But 1973 also marks the birth of hip-hop, a culture where artists like DJ Cool Herc would liberate dancing bodies from classical vinyl by extending break beats with his merry-go-round technique. Our conference this year celebrates Bruce Lee's massive contributions to the world of martial arts, as well as his undying legacy as it persists through a variety of new media and interpretations. So today, I'll be talking about how, 50 years after the first Harlem block parties, five full decades after Enter the Dragon made its American debut, DJs, MCs, breakers, writers, and poor righteous teachers, just like me, the world over, honor Bruce's life and legacy through hip-hop. For the last few years, I've been developing a college writing curriculum that I lovingly refer to as rap rhetorics. The course asks students to examine a variety of hip-hop texts in their rhetorical context in order to introduce a nuanced discussion of white supremacy, racism, and systemic violence in American history. A text, in the most theoretical sense, is considered rhetorical if it has been purposefully designed for an intended audience in response to or situated within some kind of socio-political exigency. I'll commonly refer to the dynamic relationship between these three recursive participants as the quote rhetorical situation illustrated in this diagram and also theorized in Bitzer 1968, Vats 1973, and Grant Davy 1997. An interview with Fred Brathwaite, better known as hip-hop pioneer Fab Five Freddy, makes it clear why the sociopolitical or historical context is so important for understanding the rhetorical situation of New York City in the 60s and 70s. He described the era as, quote, a time of civil unrest, when poor black kids were not given a lot of opportunities, a scene that would have been welcoming to the martial rhetorics of Bruce Lee's on-screen persona. So, to see Bruce Lee, this minority, stand up against the man was an inspiration, he says. To kids in urban communities, Lee was a symbol of a minority who fought against oppression. For many audiences, the blatant, anti-imperialist, anti-racist martial spectacle of Lee's films would echo a long American history of black rhetorical athleticism, gangsta machismo, and the anti-white supremacist discourse embodied in the 20th century fighters of color. Take the example of Jack Johnson, the first black boxer to win the world heavyweight title. Fighting for the belt in 1908, it took Johnson nearly two years to get Tommy Burns to finally accept him as a challenger. Johnson unequivocally destroyed Burns in a one-sided contest, but the final moments of the fight were never taped because police feared the public outcry. The thought of a white champion losing to a Negro boxer was a fearful idea, one the New York Times summed up by saying, quote, If the black man wins... Thousands of his ignorant brothers will misinterpret his victory as justifying claims to much more than mere physical equality with their white neighbors. Generations later, a young hothead from Kentucky would become the spiritual successor to all the badassery that made Jack Johnson such a legend. The greatest of all time, Muhammad Ali, would also clobber opponents with an unapologetic swagger, rope-a-doping and rap-attacking with poetic zingers before and after fights. And when he shocked the world by defeating Sonny Liston for the championship, he announced his new identity as a black Muslim, saying, quote, I don't have to be who you want me to be. I'm free to be who I want. It only makes sense that Bruce Lee, an avid fan of the boxer's braggadocio and martial science, embodied some of these most iconic traits in his own style. Indeed, Bruce Lee expresses a bodily rhythm all his own, but certainly influenced by Ali's float-like-a-butterfly, sting-like-a-bee mentality, or what Bowman 2011 has described as Lee's dichotomy of movement and rest. 
Beyond that, Lee's iconoclastic philosophy related to martial arts mirrored the champ's sentiment of self-actualization. Lee, at least in character, made it known that he didn't have to be anything for anyone. Fred Brathwaite sums this up by saying, quote, Because Bruce Lee had so much swag, black musicians related to him. And indeed, it would only be a year after Enter the Dragon's debut that Carl Douglas's disco hit Kung Fu Fighting took the world by storm, showing up at karaoke bars and wedding receptions across the planet. And this would also mark the start of the Bruce Bloitation, Black Bloitation, Chop Saki tradition, featuring flicks like Jim Kelly's Black Belt Jones and Ron Van Cleef's The Black Dragon. Almost as quickly as the Kung Fu craze began, these newly martialized and hybridized racial identities become a stereotype used for comedic effect. One of the first commercially successful black exploitation kung fu satires is the 1985 cult classic Last Dragon, starring Tai Mok as the laughable but lovable Bruce Leroy questing to find the mysterious glow. Later examples would include the Rush Hour franchise in the 90s, particularly Don Cheadle's performance as Kung Fu Kenny, and the Afro Samurai anime in the early 2000s with Samuel L. Jackson voice acting. For our purposes today, though, I'd like to share with you a short stand-up comedy bit by Eddie Griffin describing his impression of Bruce Lee. Content warning, this clip does feature uncensored racial slurs and profanity. That Bruce Lee was a bad motherfucker. Five foot seven, 140 pounds, dynamite. You understand me? That motherfucker in the movie, you seen that motherfucker, he walk in the dojo. 300 motherfuckers. Bruce walk in. And you know, I love that nigga walk. We can fight one at a time. All together. If you sitting in that dojo, you gotta ask yourself two questions. Either he got a bomb on his ass, or he's really a bad motherfucker. Neither one of them are good. And remember the motherfucking teachers, I was like, Wang, Tang, we ain't Wang, Wang. They run out there and get killed, nigga. <laughs> then he go with the second set. Wang, Ching, Ching Chong, Tang, Wang Long. If I'm in that second set, I'd have been like, hey, hey, hold the fuck up. Then was your black belts. My shit is orange. You the teacher, teach. Now if you whoop his ass, I'll keep taking your class. If not, I'm about to study with that motherfucker. I made a grip. You wanna do? You should slide through. Yeah, kick it like, yeah, kick it like. Kick it like Bruce, kick it like Bruce. Sip it little juice, get it little loose. Yeah, do it like Crush, hit it like Zeus. Yeah, kick it like, kick it like. There are some important rhetorical devices at work here. First, Griffin's performance, like hip hop, is highly intertextual. The first few lines of the bit are actually well circulated phrases that his audience would likely recognize. When he opens by calling Bruce Lee a quote, bad motherfucker, I'm surprised no one stood up and said, shut your mouth. Because of how the phrase had become so culturally entrenched with Shaft, the iconic black anti-hero. The next few lines where he says, quote, five foot seven, 140 pounds, dynamite, is actually paraphrased from the opening lines of the documentary Bruce Lee, A Warrior's Journey. Samples from this documentary show up in the music of Logic and many other hip hop artists frequently. Specifically, the word dynamite is doubly resonant because of the show Good Times, so much so that it actually calls at least one member of the audience to echo the word as a response, indicating, yes, I agree, and I understand. Second, Griffin signifies how Bruce Lee's bodily performance, what Brathwaite called his swag, is what led audiences of color to identify with him. At first, Griffin uses the term motherfucker generally, to refer to both Bruce Lee's character and those 300-some students training in the dojo. But because Bruce is walking in against overwhelming odds, he now is uniquely confident, someone to be referred to by his first name. But, just as abruptly, Griffin describes how he, quote, loved that inward walk. 
So either Griffin is describing the habitus of the walk or identifying with Bruce now as an N-word, the same way he later does with his audience. Either way, this is where the black-yellow minstrel comedy begins as Griffin imitates the pointing and chest-thumping gestures of Bruce, the overdubbed hyperbolic accents of the teacher, and he performs the classic minstrel character of Jim Crow. Ultimately, this short performance asks us to analyze the perceived boundaries between black and Asian bodies or cultures, both real and imagined, and question which of these we find humorous or worthy of ridicule. Similarly, hip-hop as a culture of intertextuality echoes the philosophy underpinning Bruce Lee's Jeet Kune Do by celebrating a synthesis of styles, sometimes for comedic effect, sometimes to best an opponent, sometimes to master the self. Fab Five Freddy made a point to say that, quote, Lee's martial arts style was all about free-flowing movements, to make himself like water, and that free-flowing aspect was basically what started rapping. Stickman from the acclaimed rap duo Dead Prez released a song called Bruce Lee in 2011 on his solo album The Workout that corroborates this idea. The track serves as a kind of oral history detailing Stick's journey through hip-hop and martial arts. Like Griffin's comedy, Stick references Bruce Lee's body, height, and weight in contrast to his own status as a, quote, nappy-headed little ninja who had the, quote, shuffle pad down and the cat sounds and would draw fake cuts on his chest with a red sharpie. The embodiment of Bruce Lee is also present in the beat itself as it samples or interpolates music and sound effects from Enter the Dragon. But then Stick draws a deeper parallel between hip-hop and martial rhetorics when he tells us, quote, Eventually I got to study G Kune Do That's Bruce Lee's art for those that don't know It's a martial art but it's a whole lot more It's not just kicking and punching It's the approach What I value most is the philosophy behind it Only use what works and stay open minded Express yourself, respect truth where you find it Can't be walking around out here blinded We have to be willing to change so we can grow Having no way is the way, stay in the flow Accept no limit, reject the status quo Life lessons I'ma take with me until I go Cause yo A more recent example is the RZA's Be Like Water, produced for the ESPN Bruce Lee documentary of the same name, released in 2020, where the RZA tells us, Be like water, don't be bonded. Sometimes we gotta dig deep into our inner selves, our own earth to find it. Interceptive fist, cheek condone, fluid movements even flow. Even though that it sounds like a leaf through blow, we should know it simply means to simplify, to simplify the best version of yourself. In life then, synthesize all things into one. We- I love these songs as an example of how hip-hop can serve as an homage to a person or an idea. But this is certainly not the most popular way Bruce Lee's martial ethos becomes rhetorically reinvented in hip-hop. Musicologist Griff Rolofson describes a tendency for MCs, especially those from marginalized communities, to use their words as, quote, weapons. Hip-hop potentially offers a, quote, discursive and performative field in which to vent frustrations, enact fantasies, build confidence, and formulate plots. And this was certainly true for hip-hop groups like Public Enemy and N.W.A., who ignited the 80s with hyper-violent and openly inflammatory lyrics spotlighting the miserable conditions in America for black and brown people. The former crack-dealing gods of Staten Island followed suit in 1993 when the raw and dirty ruckus of Enter the Wu-Tang 36 Chambers hit the streets. Listeners were warned to protect your neck because the Klan was kicking rhymes like Jim Kelly with their Shaolin style. And the name of the Jizz's 1995 album, Liquid Swords, also invokes this idea of martiality in rap. The RZA explains that he always envisioned his tongue as a sword, and the Wu-Tang rap style as a sword style. The cipher then was a place of building and growth, but also a place of agonism in the classical sense, like a sparring arena. Liquid swords were ones that flowed effortlessly according to the philosophy of the great kung fu cinema stars, And, nostalgically for the Jizza, it referenced the many hours spent dueling or rapping with his cousins on the Staten Island Ferry. Hip-hop would eventually develop into a platform where diverse discourse communities of color could stand and speak out against oppressive systems with the same fearlessness as the great folk heroes they idolized. Using newly accessible technologies of mass media, Two turntables and a microphone amplified the voices of those previously silenced across radio waves. 
Train cars tagged with wild-style graffiti demanded viewers across Middle America see the hate that hate produced and the ephemeral beauty exported from the ugliest slums. Eventually, video cameras helped capture the raw and grotesque nature of ghetto life central to the narratives being crafted, the music being chopped, screwed, scratched, and remixed, and the dancing signifying celebration, mourning, or war. Contemporary hip-hop is predicated upon these martial rhetorical traditions, many of which can be traced back to Bruce Lee and Wu-Tang's interpretations of Five Percenter Lessons and Kung Fu philosophy. Perhaps one of the most pronounced of these is Philippe Prosper, a Haitian-American immigrant, kung fu champion, and MC who goes by the stage name Rap is a Martial Art. Self-described as, quote, Liu Kang's hands meets Wu-Tang Clan on his 2021 song Adidas Originals, RMA's persona is a clear illustration of the highly intertextual martial rhetorical networks of identity formation and meaning-making that have operated in hip-hop since the beginning. And he's not alone. With rappers like Kendrick Lamar adopting the moniker Kung Fu Kenny and a wave of new school artists like Denzel Curry aiming to be what Eminem once called the Bruce Lee of Loose Leaf, hip-hop is crafting a martial rhetorical legacy all its own. Before I conclude, I wanted to offer just a few more brief examples of the way in which Bruce Lee's ethos and martial rhetorical legacy is preserved and iterated in hip-hop. I've created a Spotify playlist that I've linked in the description with a longer list of these songs that you can enjoy at your own leisure if you're curious, but spoiler alert, they are not all bangers. But just briefly, here's a few noteworthy ones that I wanted to shout out. Uh, the track Heavy by J-Lib, Mad Lib, J. Dilla, the infamous J. Dilla, 2003, uh, it samples a sound effect that it's officially credited as belonging to Game of Death 2, which is kind of silly. There's no original Bruce Lee audio in that film, so this was, of course, all sourced originally from Enter the Dragon. Uh, Be Water, My Friend by Melody Sheep operates as a maximal example of how auto-tuned Bruce Lee samples can be used to create music. I love this track. Comparatively, the sample from Way of the Dragon and Freddie Gibbs' Flat Tummy Tea is such an obscure one that it's nearly hidden. Yet, upon discovering that the sound effect is Bruce signaling his friend to stand down and that he would fight for him, defend him, the verse that comes after is highly complimentary. Crackers come to Africa, rabbits rappel, they rubbish me. America was the name of their fucking company. Uh, take it. If we don't take it, we don't deserve it back. In 6,000 years, the ran up, the kings of the earth is back. Supreme mathematics, I'm on the right course. Took the sword and knocked white Jesus off of that white horse. Harkening back to the plot of the film, Gibbs is talking about taking back more than a restaurant or a neighborhood, but a whole country, a way of life. He emphasizes this need for a paradigmatic shift rhetorically by attacking, quote, white Jesus with non-Western, quote, supreme mathematics and other 5% or science that invigorates the, quote, kings of the earth. Gibbs' inherited martial rhetoric is the, quote, sword that he uses against oppressive ideologies like Christianity. This echoes the RZA's position on Protect Your Neck when he violently challenges Christian teachings by saying, quote, Style the ruckus, ten times ten men committing mass sin. Turn the other cheek and I'll break the f chin. There are lots of other examples, but I'm running out of time, so I want to mention the song Bruce Lee 2019 by Marvin Gray, particularly the second verse. And the song kind of has it all. Samples, sounds, references, you name it. And additionally, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the song Canadian Bacon by Rex Life Raj, because his reference reminds me of the ways in which Bruce Lee's famous Be Like Water mantra was adapted and iterated during the 2020 Hong Kong protests. And there are plenty of throwaway references and other songs for you to discover all your own that either sexualize the Be Like Water concept or simply to describe how someone is kicking it in a variety of methods, just like Bruce Lee. But the last song I'll discuss today is Lupe Fiasco's Hip Hop Saved My Life from his platinum album, The Cool. This track has been officially anthologized in the Smithsonian collection of hip hop and rap 
as one of about a hundred songs that encapsulates the diverse histories within the culture over the past 50 years. Champ two weeks in a row, XD boy with a B-boy flow, glow like Leroy, you should see boy go, got a daddy serving life and a brother on the road, best homie in the grave. Tat- the song describes the Cinderella story for a quote, XD boy with a B-boy flow who quote, glow like Leroy, you should see boy go. Hip Hop Saved My Life describes how far the culture has come by depicting rap music as an avenue for achieving the American dream, a way of transforming concentrated effort into commercial success and financial freedom. Lupe Fiasco describes his own childhood self as a, quote, nappy head karate kid, the child of a martial arts instructor who frequently played music from the Rocky films in his dojo. He likened his own personal motivation of, quote, chasing the glow like Bruce Leroy, to the way that children today might idolize and imitate characters like Black Panther. I do this scholarship and I teach the courses I do precisely for that reason. Because personally, I wasn't initially drawn to study martial arts by Bruce Lee himself, but rather his descendants. Before I ever saw Enter the Dragon, I did a flying sidekick as Liu Kang on my brother's Super Nintendo. Right. <laughs> Before I ever saw Game of Death, I recognized the black and yellow jumpsuit, the shuffle step, the nose wipe, the screams from martial law and Tekken. For my students who are 18 years old, Bruce Lee is a meme of some guy playing ping pong with nunchucks. And hilariously, that doesn't really matter at all. What matters, I think, is that students take seriously the immense impact figures like Bruce Lee have had across such a wide array of genres and think critically about how Lee's martial rhetorical ethos is presupposed, iterated, and or remixed for a particular purpose. In other words, if I can help students think more critically about important figures like Malcolm X, Asada Shakur, and Bruce Lee by teaching them to rhetorically analyze hip-hop, then Pump up the volume, pump up the jams. We know that media interventions of martial arts are important inroads for new students and scholars, so the way I try to honor Bruce's legacy is by teaching hip-hop as a martial style all its own, rap rhetorics, to a new generation, hoping they will continue to reinvent and remix, but keep the legacy alive in their own way. Thank you very much.